The Whaler, Side B. It's obvious the whaler's den is near. I know because the trench walls are punctured by clam and wayward reeds. Shit. <laughs> A cluster of oysters ripped my pants. Their sprinkler is spitting salt water all over the place. Kind of feels like an insult somehow. <laughs> Ew. There's a crumpled crab trap with a severed foot inside. Looks like a lefty. A herd of cannonball jellyfish is lodged in the mud. One's digesting boot keys on a little orange floaty beyond the slick of its pale medusa. A massive red buoy forms a bridge across the trench. A half-eaten seal's draped over the discarded maritime architecture. The metal bottom is barnacle-crusted, starfish-clung, and graffitied. It reads, Two-headed mother, screaming silent, deep beneath the waves. What whale would listen to such a song? Ha, ha, ha. Fiddler crabs raise their inflamed claws at my presence. They're making fun of me for not getting the joke. Ow! Come here. Ow, fuck. Ow. <sighs> Take that, Mr. Pinchy. The scent is familiar of low tide and the slowness of disintegrating styrofoam coolers. It's the smell of watching Lamy's bloated dog belly drift into the marshland, where she was supposed to sail quiet and peaceful around the bend, out of sight. But she didn't get that kind of farewell, and this scent is not one of peaceful goodbye. It's the desperate odor of seeing her body beach upon the marsh banks. A fragrance of gashed knees and waist-deep mud and swatting away the flock of egrets, gulls, and herons with Labrador entrails strung through their beaks like streamers. It's the smell of a going-away party. Everyone's invited to but you. I've come across a true anomaly, Nobel Prize worthy for sure. A swath of red cut across the path from ground level to trench bottom and back up again. It's the width of an unrolled red carpet at a movie premiere. Appears to be blood of some sort. Maybe the aftermath of some injured lumbering animal. The red stuff undulates with cilia, fizzes at the touch. I can almost hear it whisper a name. Fuck it. I'm crawling through. Hope it doesn't give me some sort of rash.
I'm done crawling through the crash site of an old, diseased fishing boat smeared across the landscape. I've reached the clearing node. It's time to squeeze the sludge for my fatigues, adjust my helmet, check to make sure the pterodactyl is snug and safe. At the center of the clearing, a pile of marine creatures towers three stories high. Porpoises, whale flukes slapping against tuna, turtles, Walruses, dolphins, shark jaws chittering, still sensing prey, jellyfish, manta rays giving an occasional flap of blubbered wing, and the sudden gasp of blowhole. Around the sea animal pile, a ring of feet forms a circle. Severed human feet, of course, lined neatly around its circumference, toes pointing out, ghost crabs pecking at exposed bone. The whaler's inspecting a new pair of feet in his hands, tracing the grooves of heel and ankle before placing them in the mud. He notices me brushes his beard with a set of lifeless toes, then invites me to enter his chamber of blubber and feet. No formalities or small talk for this guy. He just hands me a small pail on the end of a long stick. The whaler instructs me, without speaking, to dip the pail in a deep wellspring of water and pour its contents onto the animals to keep them moist. The whole production goes as follows. The whaler paces around the pile, studying feet, picking them up, running his fingers along their smooth tendon lines or scars, then placing them back down, picking them up, and placing them back down. Once he finds a pair of feet to his liking, he offers them to the well where I dip the pail. Sizable fish rise to the surface and eat the feet, and the whaler catches one with a thin hooked gaff. Then he goes about finding an exhausted sea creature in the pile and feeds the fish to it. Once the pile animal eats the fish, it vomits out a new set of severed feet shimmering and amber discharge. I wet the animal with the pail. The moon flickers faint against the blue sky. A pocked dead turtle bobbing on calm seas. And the cycle continues. This I understand. You may not care to believe me but I've seen far stranger methods of searching. Paths contorted by fetish and delusion, which splay out in brilliant radials. Each one a unique longing and quest. A journey which can only be understood in full by the one undertaking the unknowns of its bends and stretches. For instance, I saw a man kneeling on a birthday cake the size of a merry-go-round, naked, impaled with a greatsword from back to front. His eyes were gone, his hands solving a Rubik's cube with rapid flurries of finger and wrist. I saw a woman who killed a bear, then put its head over her head and ran around in circles, attacking mannequins with a gas-powered push mower. Whether this is a kind of bravery or lunacy, I'm not sure. But I'll tell you this. If you can bury your feelings and keep your sanity contained, it's all a lot of fucking fun to watch. So... The whaler's behavior isn't that strange to me. 
I'll try and explain this to you. When the whaler receives a pair of feet from a porpoise mouth, he's coming to understand the journey their owner has taken, like palm reading. With spectacle and microscope, he traces the grooves of print and indentation, reverse engineering the expedition of individual souls. He doesn't care for who the feet belong to. No, not at all. He's searching for someone the owner of the feet encountered once. A unique splinter or fractured metatarsal, which would indicate that they had crossed this person, the person the whaler searches for. I smear water across the brow of a manta ray, coercing the slick ridge of cartilage into expelling the feet, which will lead the whaler to who he seeks. I want to help him find who he's looking for. Maybe a wife or husband. Someone he left asleep at a lighthouse before leaving shore on a stormy night, never to return. Maybe his firstborn, his only child that fell overboard on a deep sea fishing expedition after the whaler pushed too far out, entranced by the glinting of sailfish on a wide streak of glitter leading into the sun. A fish slides in the ray's mouth. Feet slide back out. They are the feet of a child, almost familiar in shape and color. These aren't the feet the whaler is searching for, but he seems concerned by their presence, which shifts to him being concerned by mine. He feeds the feet back to the manta ray, which receives them with a protested flap. Two dolphins and a seal over, an orca whale head emerges. The black and white of its mouth cracks open, tongue extended over porcelain gravestone teeth, with a dirty two-liter bottle of soda, still smoking with wisps of sulfur. The whaler hands the plastic bottle to me, so I can see the rotten tadpoles inside. Their fragile, broken tails and twisted, maldeveloped forelimbs. With a rattle, I hear the shrapnel of turtle beaks, the husks of small detonated explosives, clumps of dirt, singed grass. Yeah, I've seen this bottle before. Pop, says the whaler. Pop, 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 pop. One pop for each individual firecracker I put inside that bottle. Th that I was forced to put in that bottle. Well, club me like a fucking dolphin on the dance floor. It's a fighter jet, and I haven't seen a plane in over two months. I can tell by the whaler's expression he hasn't either. It feels like an exceptionally eventful magic show is about to happen. We scramble up the pile, stepping on half-dead beluga whales and finding purchase on the fins of sharks. The pile stops just a few inches below the lip of the pit. All that crosses the barrier will be our heads and my pterodactyl. Grass and wildflowers stretch out to an abrupt wall of ridgeline and cliff populated by Douglas firs. Just beyond it, Mount Tahoma, wild and surging in the summer. Snowmelt coursing down swaths of vegetation and dark rock, revealing the fractured and plated caps of glaciers, which drape the peak as if an organism in wait. 
A strip of field without trenches cuts in a wide slant up the ridge. A rather famous and flat stretch, lovingly called No Man's Taint. <clears throat> and across those meadow flats are at least 50 vehicles in a V formation. Humvees, jeeps, dune buggies trailing hundreds of kites on strings, even four-wheelers and tractors and a fucking Volkswagen Beetle. Likely every goddamn thing with wheels and an engine in a 10-mile radius. <laughs> Some idiot on a tricycle is being pulled by a snowmobile. The ground charge is spearheaded by three helicopters, and there are about... Mm, 200 soldiers present in the attack. It's the largest I've seen. The blue, yellow, and magenta banner flags tell me several clans have joined forces for the assault. The yellow clan is that of the soundless, composed of those no longer capable of speech, but capable of preemptively detecting chameleons. The blue flag is brandished by the health, those who refuse to harm other humans within the nest. And the magenta is carried by the grave, a collective of indiscriminate murderers. It's no surprise that hidden at the back of the formation is a single black flag. The black flag must belong to a new group. It trails behind a tank towing inflated animal parade balloons probably the one responsible for manipulating the other banners into banding together before their suede eel, triceratops, and toucan parade balloons. I look for a soldier with an inflatable parrot in the attack, but don't see one. Hey, old man, you ever see a soldier with a blow-up parrot? probably shitting their knickers at the bottom of a hole. The whaler doesn't say anything, but he pulls a flask out and passes it to me. Taps the metal sheath, the parrot sticker hidden on its back. <laughs> I'll take that as myth confirmed. It's at this point the red curtain parts, so to speak. If you're quiet, you'll hear the shushed pull of thick rope. Spotlight. A white-gloved magician on stage, pissing into a potted plant, then throwing it into the audience. Watch closely now. See the grass flatten? Then spring back, flatten, and spring back. Before they emerge, I can already tell there are two of them. The stratovolcano bends and smears like a fresh oil painting flung from a balcony. Gullies and passes circle in on themselves. From a hole in the air, a pink bulb appears, wet, stretching as a tethered jumper falls from a bridge. Ragged, excited, a dripping ribbon cut through the sky. I see the whole platoon too, charged on foot, hung out car doors, all opening fire on the tongue. Now the chameleons emerge, half the size of those fucking sky piercer trees behind them. One is a gargantuan panther chameleon, its mouth open, tongue extending. Blinding pinks and greens strobe along its flanks, making the lizard a neon Tokyo billboard, pulsed in streaks of pixelated bubblegum and pond scum. The other chameleon is not a known species to me. Its head bunts in a flat line, like the hammerhead shark I'm standing on, 
but with a third vertical head ridge to make it the face of a sunken cross. Perhaps it represents a now extinct species, but judging by the armored domes along its spine, I suspect this chameleon species is from the future. A future without humans, no doubt. The hammerhead chameleon's body is leaner and a tropical blue, only with an animation flushing through the scales on its side. A harpoon sinking through deep waves. <laughs> Man, I looked at the whaler, but I can't tell if he's encountered these chameleons before. The panther's mouth bellows wide, its throat inviting and warm. The rainbow of tongue licks hard into the field, lapping up soldiers and plowed earth. Take your seats, silence your cell phones. It's time for the Mount Tahoma Magic Show to begin. Missiles and party popper sparkles. Oranges ripened hot and violent in a forbidden grove. Crystal shields deflecting bottle rockets and mortar shells. A cone of hypersonic scream. Vascular systems spewing from juice box straws. Vehicular manslaughter. Ectothermic angels on all fours, vomiting out the blood of heaven to bless the battlefield. Sledges the side of his face into the ground. A shell of shockwave flashes. Fuck. Mud plastered the passing fighter jet, its engines clogged, and bodies are raining from the sky. The pilot ejects, their parachutes popping open. They drift down, surveying the bridge of retracting tongue, with soldiers and vehicles stuck to its tip. The hammerhead inspects the pilot, but the pilot wishes not to be judged by a pupil the size of a swimming pool. It's difficult to see, but the self-inflicted blood splatter on the inside of the parachute is most certainly present. Curled nice and snug in wormed flesh, the platoon writhes in reptile saliva. Firing without purpose, artillery blasting in all directions. Heavy powder shells, denting meadow and fortified chameleon breast. Broken arms glued to a soft, hungry pole. Jeep wheels spin in gasoline. The whaler and I behold an ignited inferno torch on the tip of a tongue, the seventh circle of hell exposed, thrashing and moaned, pulled tight through blistered lips of light and scale. Can you see it? 
each body bent at its own precious angle, bulging, ballooning, arms and legs turning into mist and froth, organs for creatures without bodies. They transmute to ash and confetti to sprinkle the volcano slopes, a reptilian celebration that punctures the sky and cuts through my world to flutter into yours. Tickling and distorting the last sunset you'll ever see. The one you'll glance at and then ignore on your way home from work or walking your dog. The sunset you'll forget before tucking yourself into bed, so sure of revolution and orbit and relativity. If you're listening to this story in hopes of finding meaning, go ahead and slice your ears off. Say goodbye to a hearty potted plant. Take your coffin to a baby's birthday party and lick it in front of the guests. Naked and unafraid, put on the head of a bear and attack your neighbor with a lawnmower. I'm here to put my hands on your hands, press my fingers atop your fingers, harden against those pretty closed eyes, pushing through these thin little lids, past unconstructed technicolor and void, until we touch that place the stars will not go, where I'll force your hands into the mouth of a golden wolf so it learns the taste of your blood and not the taste of mine. <laughs>